Yeah, let's, let's look to the Lord with a word of prayer. God of all creation, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to gather together this day, both online and in person. Lord, we come before you and we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. Often our lives are so full of busy work that we neglect our relationship with you. For that we are sorry. We know that you never neglect us, for if you did, our lives would cease to be. Please continue to uh, pull us to yourself, guide us in our journey, and hold us close to yourself until the day we come home to be with you forever. We thank you for your hand of blessing as we worship you this day. We ask that you would guide and direct our time together so that uh, it is a time full of wisdom and productivity and insight into your word. Please be with Pastor Emily as she preaches. Anoint her with your spirit, we pray. And Lord, this day we thank you for the veterans who uh, have served in defending our country over these many years. Thank you for the freedom that is ours. We ask your, your blessings upon them, especially those who have come home from various wars with post-traumatic stress syndrome and things, oh God. Please be very near to them. This morning, we pray for the Armstrong family. Give them your comfort and peace. We pray for Sean and the Zenaitis family, for Carol White, for Madeline Grace, for Dolores, for Rini, and we thank you for Izzy Martin's brother getting better and also for Penny. Lord, we thank you for just dear people who aren't able to join us here but are at home. We think of, of Wally Haas and and Eleanor Phillips, and, and uh, Eileen, and uh, we just pray, Lord, you be very near to them. Thank you for them, and that they're such a vital part of our church. Thank you, Lord, that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing together uh, our songs of worship.
morning's text is from Isaiah 6, beginning at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, and two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. When he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Now uh, we're going to hear an anthem. And uh, let's think about the words as we commune with the Lord together. Yeah, yeah. 
What a moment You have brought me to such a freedom I have found in you your the Pastor Emily, and it's good to be with those of you joining us online and in person this morning. I'd love to open with a word of prayer. God, this morning as we enter into the words from Isaiah, help us enter into your presence. God, we pray that your spirit would speak and move and call us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Pastor Jim started a new sermon series a few weeks ago where we're looking at questions that are raised in the Bible. So far, we've looked at questions from the Garden of Eden and questions from the mouth of Jesus. The first week, God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? They were hiding in the Garden of Eden because they had eaten the forbidden fruit. They felt shame, and yet God, he knew where they were, and he called to them. And then the second week of this series, Pastor Jim raised the question that Jesus raised before he healed a man. 
when Jesus looked at him and said, do you want to be made whole? And that question, we've been joking about it in the office because for all of us, that's been stirring inside of us all week. Do we really want to be made whole? And what, what does that look like? These are questions that are raised in Scripture that they draw us towards the life of God. There's a work that happens in our soul when we live with some of these questions. So today's question, it takes us into the book of Isaiah. When Isaiah hears God ask, who will go for us? Isaiah, he has the privilege of listening listening in on the concerns of God. And he's so moved by the holiness of God that he wants to be part of God's mission in the world. Isaiah hears this question and he volunteers himself. How do we respond to this question? Who will go for us? I believe this is a question that God continuously asks over and over. When Jesus is alive centuries later, he looks at the crowds at one point and he has compassion on them because he sees people that are harassed and helpless. He says they're like sheep without a shepherd. And in this moment, he turns to his disciples and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He tells the disciples to pray for God to send workers into his harvest field. We still see the character of God saying, who will go for us? A God who wants to draw near and wants us to experience him. God, I believe, has always cared about mission and still cares about mission. And it's interesting to notice when Isaiah receives this vision from God. He receives it at a very difficult point in history. It's in the year that King Uzziah died. And King Uzziah, he reigned when Israel was prosperous. Their culture had become very materialistic and a little bit arrogant. They were comfortable being comfortable, and they served their own personal pleasures. But King Uzziah dies right when this, the Assyrians are gaining power and control in the area. And this is actually a time when Israel is facing new threats and when they're moving into a time of decline. And it's in this difficult moment that Isaiah has a vision from God. Isaiah, he sees God seated in the temple, the train of his robe filling the space. It's a grand scene. Heavenly creatures, they're flying and calling to one another, proclaiming the holiness and the glory of God. Their voices are so powerful that the thresholds shake and the temple is filled with smoke. This is quite the vision. I mean, can you imagine being in this space, getting a taste of heaven and the glory and the holiness of God? This scene, it's not an everyday scene. <laughs> and it's a scene that leaves Isaiah shaking in his boots. The majesty and power of God are so evident that he becomes painfully aware of his humanity and his sin. He feels the gap between the holiness of God and the reality of his words and his actions. He cries out, woe to me, which is a kind of curse. He thinks he's so unworthy to be in the presence of God that he should be cursed. And he says, I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king the Lord Almighty. So at, in the context of the Old Testament, they believed that if they saw God, that they would die. So Isaiah, he's, he's terrified. He thinks that this is it. But God sees and responds differently than Isaiah expects to that. I want to focus in on, on seeing with a new kind of clarity. Um, in a simplified version, uh, Ricky and I recently moved, and my apartment 
living room furniture became our sunroom furniture. And in the living room of my apartment, it was, it was dark. I didn't have a lot of windows. I just had lamp lighting. And I thought that my furniture was white. <laughs> I put it in the sunroom of our new house with like all this wonderful natural lighting uh, and really strong overhead lighting also that I had not had at my apartment. And I looked at my furniture and it was not white. <laughs> I saw stains that I didn't know were there. I was like, where did these come from? Like, I, I had white furniture, and I looked at the rug, again, that I thought was white, and it was yellow, like a dingy yellow. <laughs> and I looked at this furniture, and I thought, what is this? I don't, I don't recognize my stuff. I don't recognize my home. And it's like for Isaiah, the lights were turned on, and his life had gotten a little dustier than he had realized. There was some neglect. Uh, the holiness of God wasn't, wasn't shining in his soul. And when he encounters God, the lights are turned on in a different kind of way. But Isaiah, he thinks that this dust makes him worthless. How, however, God, he responds differently. Isaiah's awareness and humility and remorse, it actually opens an opportunity for God to do some dusting and some cleaning. One of the seraphim takes a coal from the altar, and the altar was where the people would give sacrifices to God to atone for their sins. The seraphim takes this coal, and he touches the lips of Isaiah. You remember, Isaiah's first concern was, I am a man of unclean lips. So the seraphim touches his mouth with this coal, and he's cleansed, he's forgiven. It's like a refining fire. In the book of Malachi, there's, there's a reference to the refining fire of God. It's, it's scary, but not in a destroying kind of way, in a refining, beautiful kind of way. In Malachi, the verses say, But who can endure the day of God's coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. I think of the coal that refined Isaiah's mouth as the refiner's fire. A refiner, to give you a little bit of background, melts down metal like gold or silver in order to purify it. And when it's melted down, the impurities rise to the surface and they can be removed. And then when the metal cools, it's, it's more pure than it had been originally. There may be times in our life when there's a pain associated with noticing things that we need to let God purify. But it's not a pain that's meant to harm us or a pain that we need to um, avoid. It's a pain that we can lean into because God will do good, purifying, holy work when we allow ourselves to notice and to see with the lights on. I love that God's holiness doesn't heap shame on Isaiah, and it doesn't push him away. He's forgiven and he's cleansed, and he's actually drawn into God further. He has the privilege of listening in on God's concerns, and he hears that God is worried about who's going to go for us. And after experiencing the beauty and the holiness of God, Isaiah can't help but want to participate. And he says, here I am, send me. Have you ever encountered somebody that reminded you of the dust and the dirt that you had allowed to build up in your life? And I'm, I'm not talking about people who make us feel ashamed or less than. I'm talking about people that we encounter who shine so brightly we want to be more like them, who inspire us forward in a different kind of way. I felt like I was present for a holy moment when I attended a celebration of life service um, 
for the pastor at my husband's home church. He passed away a few weeks ago unexpectedly. He was a 40-year-old man with a wife and four children. And um, I attended the celebration of life, and it was such a witness of faith. Uh, This pastor, his father, was also a pastor in the South, and um, he chose to speak at his son's memorial. And when I heard this man speak, it was, it was holy ground. I heard a man whose whole life had been shaped by his love for God, by his love for his family. And it was humbling and inspiring to hear him. I wanted to be more like this family. I wanted to have faith more like this family as I listened to them. The father, he, he started out saying, <laughs> I don't know how you talk to God. Maybe it's like the King James Bible with these and thous, but I tend to be a little more straight with God. (laughs) And he said, when my son passed, I asked God, what's up? We've seen a miracle before. I'm sure you have more miracles. Where was the miracle? He was honest. Um, And he had this sense, I could tell this is a man who listens for God, too. He said, I had a sense of God telling me, your son is the miracle. The Hebrew people wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and you enjoyed your son. I know that you think he's yours, (laughs) but he's always been mine. I loaned him to you, <laughs> and, and I celebrate that you enjoyed him, and now he's home with me. And this pastor, he said, what do you do when you th- hear God telling you that? <laughs> Thank you? What do you say? And he then, he went into telling a story about his son, and he, he said, I remember a time when my son asked to drive my Mustang. And he said, I don't let anyone drive my Mustang. I don't even let people sit behind the wheel of my Mustang. (laughs) But on this day, I let my son drive my Mustang. And I saw him pull out of the driveway with the top already down. Who did he think he was? (laughs) I saw him go up one hill and down the other, and then up the hill out of sight. And I saw my son just keep driving. And he told the congregation, that's how I choose to remember my son. He just kept driving. And he's with with God. And I, I listened to this man honestly share his process of grief, of praying in frustration, of listening for God, tending him. And I thought, I want to be like that man. It's a man who I could hear he's been shaped by scripture. He's been shaped by prayer. He's been shaped by love for God and love for his son. And it was a holy moment where I could feel the gap between my current state and where he was in his journey. And it wasn't a gap that made me want to shrink away or think I wasn't good enough. It was a gap that I wanted to move into. I wanted to move closer to God. And I think that's what Isaiah experienced. This initial humility of, oh God, I'm not good enough. But then realizing that God's holiness doesn't push us away, it draws us in and it sends us on mission. We hear God saying, who will go for us? Who will take this beautiful holiness into the world? Who will be shaped by me? Holy encounters, they might sit differently with us at different times. Sometimes we might not want to see the gap that exists, and it's tempting to belittle the other or belittle the situation. But there's something good that happens when we let ourselves get a little bit uncomfortable. God wants more of us. 
who will go for us? Have you experienced the holy, magnificent power of God? And maybe that's the first prayer today, to have a holy encounter. Once we have, I think it becomes clear that God is not a stagnant God. He's on mission constantly, constantly looking to refine and to heal. And he's always asking, who will go for us? James 1.27 in the New Testament, it sums up what it looks like when religion is refined and purified. In James, it says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. God asks us, who will go for us? How do we answer over and over again? Let us pray. God, we thank you for uh, holy moments when we come into your presence and we feel the power of your goodness. Lord, refine us, refine our hearts, minds, and souls. And as we realize how beautiful it is to be in your presence, set a fire in our hearts that we would want to go out and spread that kind of presence in the relationships that we engage with, in the world around us, that your light may shine. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was a very powerful sermon and as we take the bread let's just reflect upon what we just heard um, this past week Pastor Emily and I met with the other pastors and leaders that use our facilities here and it was just such a precious time to share our hearts and to pray together and to hear what's going on in the other churches as well as our own church and as uh, Emily was sharing, she was saying something that really touched my heart. She said, this is a kind of a sweet time in our church. And, uh, you know, she has a new husband. I mean, it's her first husband, but it's, uh, <laughs> that didn't come out quite right. But, but anyway, but how, what a sweet time that's been. And then, then she also shared about the small group and, and the people in the church. And she said, I just love the people here. And I've been thinking about, Penny and I say that often, we just love the people here in our church that we've got to know over these last 41 years and think of those who have passed on. Uh, I was thinking about John Lindvall today and how he instilled in us this whole idea of mission and his generosity and such a wonderful man of God. And as Pastor Emily was sharing today about that pastor that just died in his 40s, such a young guy, that he's with the Lord now and how difficult those times can be yet our hope isn't here in this world but it's in the world to come that we'll be with the lord someday that we're promised eternal life and if we take the the bread just hold it together and sim symbolizing our oneness in the faith and and just think about how god has uh, kind of wrapped us in righteousness you know, the robes of righteousness because of what christ has done on our behalf um, he's he sees us in a righteous way as we commit ourselves to him. So hold on to the, to the bread and we'll partake of it together.
Jesus on the day in which he was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, as we break the bread and we think of your broken body for us, and we think of those who have, who have died and have gone to be with you, we are reminded of those things which are most important, and that is our relationship with you. Lord, we thank you that you are high and lifted up, that you are a God who uh, visits us in just mysterious ways and draws us near to yourself, though we're not worthy of that, but you still invite us to come to your table and experience your grace and love. So, Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for just your love for us. We thank you for just being a God who cares about your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I just encourage you to continue to enjoy a time of prayer, um, inviting God's refining love and forgiveness. Jesus was sitting with the disciples, he took the cup, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. God, we, we pray for forgiveness for the ways that we have not loved you or loved our neighbor. And God, we thank you for your amazing love that continues to welcome us, to dust us off, and to pick us back up. Lord, help us walk in you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. When uh, Mrs. Griffith donated this property, there were four ministers who held it in trust until it became incorporated. And one of those ministers was Dr. Harry Butman. And Harry Butman was the founder of the International Congregational Fellowship and just a wonderful person who had a real heart for missions. And I remember one time he, uh, we were having lunch together and he said, you know, Jim, the nice thing about when we give, it, our money can go to places where we can't go. We heard a great, story, a great sermon today about whom shall I send and, and God sends us into the world. But Sometimes we can use our money to touch people in Africa or the Ukraine or the Philippines. And uh, as we give, we can, uh, it can be used to be a blessing to others. 
So as you give today, uh, give first to our own church, you know, and the ministries here, and then if you want to give extra towards some of these other mission projects, feel free to do that, whether it's Ukraine or, um, or if you wanted to go to Africa or the Philippines or whatever, just mark it on your, on your check and we'll make sure it goes there. So um, we'd like the ushers now to wait upon us for our tithes and our offerings. Let's pray together. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple with, with glory. The whole world might know of his glory. Lord, we thank you for giving us funds that we might be able to bless those around us. Thank you, Lord, that someday the whole world will know that you are the exalted one. Thank you, God, for just this message we've heard this day. And Lord, help us to be willing to follow in your footsteps. And thank you for this time together. Thank you for your spirit that moves among us. Thank you for your tremendous love and grace that you demonstrate to us. And for just giving a little glimpse of your holiness once in a while, we're grateful for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, stand and sing the last hymn together.
and addiction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forever. Amen.